Hi, everybody. I'm Jennifer Jarlin, chairman of the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition. We're in the middle um, session for this wonderful webinar series. Um, so forgive me if I am repeating myself and you've been on Monday and Tuesday, uh, this will be a little bit of a repeat, but in any case, for those of you who are new, the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition is a not-for-profit organization working to advance diversion and composting of organics in Illinois, with a focus, of course, on food scraps. We foster the growth and sustainability of the composting industry through connecting stakeholders, providing education and resources, by being active in the community and implementing programs, and by focusing on strengthening the market for quality compost. Our members represent a wide, uh, a wide spectrum of stakeholders, including community government, excuse me, including community and government organizations, businesses, schools, institutions, service providers, compost processors, and individuals, just to name a few. This slide in the top right is all of our generous partners that contribute to the work that we do. Please follow us on social media to see all of the great news about the growing success of the Illinois composting movement. Those are the links there. Those are all on our website as well. So please do visit that. IFSC is your local compost coalition and the United States Composting Council, USCC, is a national composting authority. We are the state chapter of the US Composting Council. So if you're not already members of IFSC or USCC, please, we encourage our attendees today to join in the collaboration because it's your involvement and your knowledge that makes our organization stronger, smarter, and more effective. So please do consider joining us. The theme for this year's International Compost Awareness Week is Grow, Eat, Compost, Repeat. And each day of this week, uh, we've been digging into one element of, of the cycle. Today's speakers will um, be focusing on the name of the game that we're here to talk about, compost. So feeding the pile of knowledge and stirring up our interest and passion for recycling our food scraps through various means in a variety of settings. IFSC committees of interest to people who are into this part of the cycle might be the Compost Market Development Committee and the Education Committee if you want to get involved on that level. On behalf of the IFSC Board of Directors, our active committees, and the planning committee for this online educational series. I thank you for attending and welcome you to the feast. Bon appetit. Thank you, Jen. Um, and my name is Kate Caldwell and I'm going to be the moderator today. Um, and I'm really excited to be introdu introducing Jen and Liz in just a moment. I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I am a passionate backyard and community composter and a member, a member of Illinois Food Scrap Coalition Communications Committee, and that highlights prom and promotes the achievements of the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition and its members. And the reason that I joined in the first place was to get connected so that I could take what I'm so passionate about, which is composting, just in my own little personal world and connect my community to it. And Illinois Food Scrap Coalition has done that. And then I've also been connected to Go Green. So it's been a wonderful ride so far. Um, I'm happy to be moderating today because I am a backyard composter and I wanna stay connected to people like you who are interested in composting for various reasons. We all have our different walks of why we wanna compost. and. For me, I am a backyard composter. And if you missed our prior lunch um, and learns this week, do not spare. We will be putting together recordings of all of our presentations this week, all of our lunch and learns, which is what this is today, um, on our YouTube channel. And we encourage you to share, share, share today. Um, so uh, today we are going to be talking about uh, reasons and ways to start and expand, ex expanding composting in your community, wherever that may be. 
And our Q&A will be after the presentation, but feel free to type your questions in as the program progresses in the chat. Um, so, and as you can see uh, with this slide right here, uh, what community you hope to get or expand in composting, um, please share that in the chat because that's what this is all about today. Um, and also your role related to composting. Are you a municipal leader? Are you a commission member, government agency, community member, nonprofit, et cetera? Please identify yourself in the chat so we can get to know you. All right, so I'm really excited to introduce our two presenters here. Um, we have Jen Nelson and Liz Kunkel who will be co-presenting together. Um, and again, they will be uh, sharing the presentation. So if you do have questions, um, they're, they're, it's not like there's a stop and then a start again. They will be going all the way through together. They'll be team presenting. So, and I'll be watching your questions as they go. So let me introduce Jen Nelson first. Jen Nelson works for seven generations ahead as a zero waste program expert. She works with communities, institutions, businesses, schools, events and residents to develop sustainability goals and to take those goals from idea to action. This includes strategic planning, waste and cost analysis, outreach, education, and more. Jen is a founding board member of the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition, working to advance food scrap co composting through policy and infrastructure change and she is a member of the Illinois Wasted Food Action Alliance. So that's Jen Nelson. Liz Kunkel is the founder and president of Go Green Winnetka, a Winnetka environmental and forestry commissioner and a zero waste consultant for collective resources compost. She is a member of the communications committee at Illinois Food Scrap Coalition and the Target Organics Committee at the U.S. Composting Council. She is all about reducing, diverting, and composting food and other organic waste all the time. Yay. All right, so feel free. Uh, I'm gonna be asking uh, people to put your questions in, in again as the slideshow continues, but uh, right now, Take it away, Liz. Thanks, Kate. You are welcome. Uh, thank you. Thanks for that introduction. Thank you, Jen Jarland, for your introduction. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. So as Kate said, we're going to uh, jump into um, the, the crux of it today, or as Jen said, the name of the game, as you will, if you will, the compost piece of it. But before we talk about um, all the different ways and means that can be used to compost food scraps and other organics in Illinois, I want to talk a little bit about why there's a need to do that, why putting food waste in the landfill to begin with is such a problem. And by the way, I may use the phrase land, uh, sorry, uh, food waste, food scraps, somewhat interchangeably. Um, organics uh, tends to be food scraps and potentially paper waste, um, but typically we're focusing a little bit more on the food waste and food scrap side, but it's also important to compost other organics. So the reason it is such a problem to landfill food waste and other organics is because when those materials go to landfill, they cannot break down properly. They don't have the proper oxygen and they cannot biodegrade and then they release methane. Methane is anywhere from 30 times more potent in the long term to 80 times more potent in the short term at capturing uh, carbon dioxide and heating the planet. If food waste, fascinatingly, if food waste were a country, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases behind China and the United States. So you can see food waste is really a huge problem. Luckily, there are some solutions. Next slide. So, as we said, the name of the game, composting. Composting your food waste is a, the best solution for keeping, land, for keeping those food scraps and food waste out of landfill. Um, again, building on the previous slide, food waste that goes to landfill doesn't break down properly. What's 
coming to the fore now a little bit more than it has is recently is the emphasis and focus on methane as a problematic greenhouse gas as opposed to carbon dioxide, which many of us have heard about for a long time. We're discovering that because methane is so much more potent at capturing heat in the in the atmosphere, um, it it is a much bigger driver of climate change. And so we're hoping to sort of shift the efforts to really focus on that methane capture as much as carbon dioxide capture um, and reduction, obviously. So the headline that's on the right uh, of the screen uh, I think it's the right, I apologize, on one side of the screen uh, is a New York Times article that just came out in the last couple of days really focusing um, on the need to, to, uh, to focus our efforts on that methane piece uh, in addition to the carbon dioxide. So uh, next slide. So for those reasons, compost really helps combat climate change in a really direct way. Composting food scraps both reduces the uh, emission of new greenhouse gases by letting that food waste break down properly and not releasing methane. Compost being using compost in soil actually improves that soil as has been said previously, if you joined us Monday or Tuesday, um, adding the compost to soil creates a healthier soil and uh, helps that soil absorb uh, greenhouse emissions, greenhouse gas emissions that are already in our atmosphere. And then that healthy soil also helps increase our resistance to the, uh, sorry, resilience, I apologize, resilience to the effects of climate change. Um, again, by uh, increasing and improving soil health, which then helps decrease erosion during rain events and can, on the flip side, help retain water during drought events. So it helps us um, combat climate change in a really pragmatic way. Um, you, some of you may be familiar with a, a program called uh, Project Drawdown. Uh, there's a book uh, by the same name that was published in 2017. And it's a, um, an effort to come up with the basically top 100 solutions that will be the most impactful at not just reducing climate change, but actually reversing it. So drawing down the carbon in the atmosphere and reducing um, what's out there. And Again, for me, I was really struck by this when I read this book a few years ago to find out that number three on that top 100 list of things that we can do with the greatest impact, number three is reducing our food waste behind managing use of refrigerants uh, and wind power. And I was really, really struck by that statistic that food waste, just reducing food waste is the number three thing we can do. And then further down on the list, number 60 is composting that food waste. So if you take the effort to reduce and then compost your food scraps, you're doing two of the top 100 things that any individual can do to make a difference and really having a significant impact. So these are just a couple of the ways that we know composting can help. And obviously if you have other ideas or other experiences with, with how and why compost is helpful in, to you personally, your community, the environment, please throw those in the chat too. We, we absolutely want to hear everyone's experience with composting and, and, and why it's a good thing for you. So composting at base, sorry, next slide, Jen, I apologize, thank you. Thanks for reading my mind. Um, so composting is nature's way of recycling this organic material, including food waste. It is the process of converting and preserving nutrient-rich organic material, which includes the food waste, also includes 100% paper, cotton, textile waste, yard, yard waste trimmings, and it turns it all into a healthy soil amendment. Then this organic material can be processed on site, um, either on a, in, an, in an industrial setting, um, I'm sorry, I meant in, um, uh, an institutional setting on site, like at a school or smaller scale in your backyard or larger scale through the commercial programs um, that we've touched on the last couple of days. That finished soil amendment, regardless of what process you used, is then the actual compost. And I was really struck by the speakers on Monday, both Teresa Johnson and, and farmer Fred Daniels, who both used some similar language in summing up the benefits of composting, that it leads to better soil, which leads to better plants, which leads to better food. And Fred said, it's good for the soil, it's good for the community, and it's good for the environment. And it based, that's why we're here, because we think that's how impactful composting is and can be. Next slide, please. And equally importantly, composting is an equitable solution. 
it closes the loop and moves us away from a linear uh, model of consumption where our waste goes somewhere ostensibly out of sight, out of mind, but it's not for everybody, <laughs> um, not the people who live in those communities where, where um, landfills are or where waste ends up. Um, and so composting is a way to, like I said, close the loop. Uh, tomorrow we'll talk more about how to use finished compost to get back into that growing piece at the front of the pre front of the week, right? Getting healthy soil to then have, um, be able to grow healthy food. Um, and I think it's important to remember that that at base, healthy soil is a luxury. It's a luxury that some of us are, are lucky enough to have um, and that focusing our efforts, especially those of us who are lucky, um, to focus those efforts on food recovery, food waste reduction, and composting will all help contribute to a more fair, equitable, and just society. Next slide. So I also like composting because to me, it just makes sense. It's logical. Uh, for me, like Jim said yesterday, I came at composting from recycling. It was sort of a natural extension of, if I have this thing in my hand and I don't want to put it in landfill, what can I do with it instead? Um, and that was really how it started for me. And then as you can tell, I, I, I became very passionate about it when I realized how important it is to do. But I, I love advocating for it because it's so easy also. It, it makes sense. So this slide is all about what you can put in your pile or your bin or your container, whatever it is. And the basic message and, and reminder to keep, to keep in your head is if it grows, it goes. Or everything that was once, once alive may ultimately be composted. So basically you want a mix of green materials, which are nitrogen rich materials, which are the food scraps, indoor plant, grass clip, clippings, some weeds, some prefer not to have weeds, but um, you can use that kind of, and then vegetarian waste, you don't want animal waste, but some um, vegetarian pet waste, like from smaller animals would be uh, acceptable. And then the key is to mix that green waste with brown or carbon rich material such as um, leaves, twigs, straw, sawdust from untreated wood, um, shredded paper, um, which actually cannot be composted, I'm sorry, cannot be recycled. Shredded paper messes up with the machinery, but that shredded paper may be composted and is actually helpful. So it based the, the food scraps want the brown woody material to help break down. That's the, that's how, that's the, that's the, that's the composting process. That's how it is made. So, um, if you're doing it in your backyard, uh, it's, again, I think Teresa mentioned this the other day, a good rule of thumb is that for each each amount, each batch of green nitrogen rich material you have, you want about two times that amount, if not more of brown or carbon rich material. And that will help with um, odors and pests and things like that. Um, and then um, for what it's worth, I, again, in my backyard, the way I, it can be hard to come up with enough brown material um, to balance out your food waste. Um, I like using peat moss and you can get it easily at local hardware stores and landscape stores. It is pun intended dirt cheap and it makes sure you have that volume of brown available to have a healthy and uh, successful backyard composting experience. So next slide. So again, composting makes sense. To me, it's very logical what goes in, everything that was once alive. We wanted to make sure it's uh, that you remember that it is very important to make sure that non-organic materials do not go in the compost bin. Um, traditional things like plastic bottles, bags, any sort of, um, again, physical container um, for, the, for the food scraps or organic waste if it's not uh, a compostable material. All of those things provide, uh, create contamination that become very problematic. So do pay attention to what goes in and what doesn't. And obviously you have questions, come back on Friday for Ask the Expert, ask us today, and or follow up with the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition. Because again, that's what we're all about is creating resources and having people around to answer questions to move the efforts forward. So don't let, don't let any questions stop you. Just ask them and move forward. Okay. So again, at base, I'm, I, I like composting because it's easy. Um, you can do it in your backyard if you have one. Um, and then there are also these other options that are available in various communities, various states. I mean, each state, each community might have its own solution. And so part of what we're doing at IFSC is showing what all the different options are in, in your individual community. So there are resources on the IFSC website that relate to which haulers are in each community and what kind of options are available. 
So again, to start with, a backyard option is great. Um, then if you scale up, there are more commercial options that Jen will get into a little bit um, um, on the next slide, but all of these other bullet points beyond the backyard are often the commercial level, which is you're basically mixing that food, food, sorry, food waste with landscape waste or yard waste at a larger scale, which lets things like meat and bones and dairy be included that cannot be included in a backyard system. So that's one of the that's the primary one of the primary benefits of the commercial systems. But again, what's nice about them is that there are lots of different options. So if you can't do it in your backyard, you might have another option to still take food scraps um, away from your from your house from your home. Um, some communities include a year round third bin along with recycling and uh, landfill containers. Um, many communities offer a seasonal ride along program where your food waste may be um, picked up along with your yard waste. Um, there are also companies like my employer, Collective Resource Compost, which uh, offer container swap services. And honestly, the reason Erlene Howard started this company is because she lived in an apartment and didn't have easy access to composting. That's exactly how it came about to help create that access. So that's what's called a container swap model, where you have a, a bin in your house, a container, you might have a five gallon bucket, in a garage or in a common area and or a, a larger tote where the food scraps all go and then again whether landscape waste gets mixed in with at that level at the home level if not then it'll be mixed in when it goes to a commercial facility to be processed with other landscape waste um, and then there are more uh, um, sort of one-off ad hoc events. Um, sometimes there are drop-off programs, there are collection events. Uh, one of the best known one in, ones in our area is the pumpkin smash that Scares hosts every year to collect pumpkins after Halloween. Um, so there are often individual events, sometimes a, a Go Green group or related environmental group might, um, might host one. There might be community gardens, not listed on this slide, but sometimes a community garden can be an endpoint for that food scrap um, waste. Um, so there, Again, what I like about composting is that there's lots of, lots of options and basically no matter where you live, wh wherever in Illinois and whatever kind of living arrangements you have, single family home, multi-unit dwelling, anything in between, there's a compost solution for you. And again, we at IFSC are here to help you help you figure that out for you. Next slide, please. Okay. Now I'm gonna shift it over to Jen to talk more about commercial composting um, and other things. Thank you, Liz. And now that she has us all fired up with her love for composting, um, I wanna take a minute to celebrate how far we've come in Illinois. Um, backyard composting is really a fantastic way to manage some food scraps at home with a much smaller environmental footprint but backyard or at-home composting is not sufficient by itself. As Liz just mentioned, um, there are people who live in apartments and they don't have the space to be able to compost on their own. Um, yesterday's discussion, we learned about schools and restaurants that are diverting their food scraps for compost. Um, and one reason that this is happening more and more in Illinois um, is because commercial composting is a game changer for institutions, businesses, municipalities, and households without that outdoor space for composting. With commercial composting, all food scraps and food contaminated um, paper or cardboard can be collected. It can include meat, dairy, bones, greasy pizza boxes. Um, and this, all of this organic waste is hauled to a composting facility where it decomposes and finished compost is then created and sold commercially. All food scraps get to be collected through commercial composting. Um, Liz mentioned, you know, if it's been alive or if it grows, it goes. Um, there are all these things to know, but one thing to know is that it is a science. How you bring food scraps and yard waste together in just that right mix that she described. And so um, science is done differently by different scientists. So it's important to know where you're sending your food scraps and your yard waste because each of those businesses may be um, willing to take different materials then. So look to your own community, find out what program you have and figure out what's acceptable there. Um, I, I just wanna say the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition and all of our members and partners have collaborated to advance both policy and infrastructure in Illinois. 
And it's really amazing to see what's been accomplished over the past years. We've had um, many Illinois laws that encourage infrastructure and resource development that foster growth in the composting industry. And um, IFSC works to support policies that do promote composting and increase the diversion of food scraps from landfill. I've listed on this slide um, some resources. You'll be able to get the slides later from this presentation and click through to see lists of programs that have been added, the kinds of policies that have been developed since you know, 2009, um, where policy was passed to allow food scraps to be hauled separately from, um, from the landfill. And I just think it's exciting to see how much growth there's been. We look at the 60 municipal composting programs that are in place right now. Just to think about it, there have been 15 added since 2019. So during a pandemic, we still had more communities wanting to take on providing the ability for their residents to have a way to compost food scraps. Um, I just, I think that's exciting to think about. We have 189 recognized We Compost partners, and this is a free recognition, but it's a way that we can also acknowledge and support those businesses that are, are choosing to do this. I bring this up, I know we're talking about community composting today and municipal composting, but it is this whole infrastructure that develops around composting that's required for us to be able to do this in our communities. We need those businesses and institutions to be a part of this, and we need this to be something that is profitable for all of the businesses that support it, whether it's our haulers or the compost processors. And so I'm, I've shared with you these ways that we've it's become more widespread. But honestly, I think a big part of what we've done is done a nice job of letting people know that we should be separating food scraps from the landfill. And where we have more work to do is in looking at how we can support compost processing businesses. And I would invite you to tune in tomorrow to learn more about how important it is for us to be doing this to support the compost processors in Illinois. And the main way that we can do this is by buying and using compost. And I think that's exciting. When you think about the benefits that Liz talked about, we don't get those benefits. You know, half of them we lose if we're not actually buying and using the compost. Um, the graph that's shared on this shows you that we really don't have enough compost being purchased in Illinois to make this a viable industry for, for our compost processors. We have, you know, we have close to 50 processors that are permitted, but half a dozen of them will accept food scraps at this point. So we need this to be affordable. Liz also mentioned contamination as a big issue, and that is the next thing we really need to be focusing on. Um, and this is something that each of us on the line today can be working on. We need to make sure that we are only putting in the compost what can go in the compost, whether that, whether that the food scraps are being what we sort in our own home or whether we're looking at how the yard waste is being collected in our yards and making sure that there isn't accidentally a trowel in there or I think at one point they told me they found a bowling ball in the compost processing facility <laughs> that made it all the way through. Um, anything that we can do to make this better is, is really, is really going to help this industry grow. And I want to leave you with a message that this really is easy to get started. Liz told you how much she loves it. She told you how many different ways you can get involved and be composting in your community. And I want you to know that it's not hard. There are all these different ways because it's different where you live. It may be different in your community, but there are resources for everyone in those varieties. And that's an important part of, of the tools that we're sharing with you today and throughout the series this week. There's information on the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition website, um, and this information is changing all the time. Check out our website, look at our toolkits, guides, one-pagers, and more. Um, and, and I think there's an exciting announcement that you'll hear more about tomorrow, but there's a new Using Compost Guide being released today that talks about how you can use compost, how you can use it in landscaping, how you can be using it if you're a park district. So I, this is an area where I couldn't be more excited about listening to what's coming out tomorrow. Um, usually I'm excited about what I'm presenting about, but tomorrow's gonna be a day too. 
So I do want to share um, back to our topic of municipal composting. We do have a guide that Illinois Food Scrap Coalition and so many of our partners work to develop that supports municipalities. Um, it helps identify what are some of the things you want to think about if you want to make composting available to your residents. Um, and to flip that around, if you're a resident wondering whether your community offers composting, we have answers to that. We can tell you what kinds of programs are offered in which Illinois municipalities. But this guide also has some tips for how you can start the conversation or continue or grow the conversation in your community. We also have a number of really amazing experts on the line today calling in. Um, Liz and I have the pleasure of being the ones to speak to you on behalf of our committees, but really it's the collective knowledge and the collective resources that, that make this so impactful. So we have come up with a bunch of ways that you can take action. And I'm going to turn the mic over to our lovely moderator, Kate, to take us through this. Um, but everything in here is linked and you will get this slide so that you can go and find where all these great resources are. So Kate, take it away. All right. Well, thank you so much, Liz and Jen. You did an amazing job and Everything you've done thus far, your credentials are mind blowing. So thank you so much, all in the name of compost and saving the planet. So yeah, the next step, um, this very inspirational presentation um, leads to uh, call to action. So the way you can do it as an individual is uh, learn about solutions from Project Drawdown, which I've heard of and shamefully I have not uh, dove into. So I am definitely going to be looking at Project Drawdown. That sounds amazing. And that talks about reducing food waste and uh, compost food waste. Um, and then the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition, near and dear to my heart, that's what got me started with being connected, you know, from my backyard to, you know, everybody else. Um, and meeting wonderful people like you. I loved all the uh, background information everybody shared with us in the beginning about where you're from. Um, but uh, Illinois Food Scrap Coalition is all about purchasing compost if you want to buy it, which is so important. I learned from the last two presentations uh, yesterday and the day before that we got to close that loop and we got to buy the compost. Um, that is the next big step. And then, of course, using the compost. Um, as far as the collective public, the community, reaching out, getting everybody else to do it, which is essential. It's so important. I think I saw a, a statistic of 40% of, of food waste goes to the landfill. And that can't be, that can't be that. Could you imagine if we just took all that and, and made it into compost? Um, so communities next, find out if your community has a program and either support that program or help to get one started and Illinois Municipal Residential Programs. Uh, I think that's a link right there, Jen. Yes, okay. Uh, that's in your community level. On your state level, um, support state policy. This is the tough one. This is where it's like, I shy away. It looks, seems overwhelming. But uh, that's the next step for all of us is to step in and uh, put our boots on and start uh, supporting state policy that encourages composting. There's a state bill 1167 that talks about food scraps hierarchy um, and SR 0220 declares the week of May 2nd through May 8th as compost awareness week. But honestly, these compost, these, these things are designated as days or months or weeks. They should be every second of every day, right? But yeah, this is a great week help, helping us to enhance our awareness. So uh, yeah, that is something that is already happening um, in the state of Illinois. And then national. All right, now we're going to national. Uh, Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Ah, I'm all over that one. And they've got some, some bills there as well that uh, you can go to. Um, it's S984 and HR2238. Um, that would help to finance compost infrastructure. So that is so, so important. All right. Um, so if you feel inspired now, you're going to go out and take action. Don't leave. I see some fantastic questions and some fantastic comments that were coming in um, on the chat. 
Um, and we're gonna try our best to answer um, as many of them as possible. If you feel that you know something else is gonna spawn another question or your question didn't quite get answered, um, to, on Friday, there is a big Q&A session um, that will be happening. Um, so that's where you will be able to ask. Um, there's two experts. It's not, it's not gonna be Jen and Liz. They'll, they'll be uh, listening and watching, I'm sure, but it'll be uh, two other presenters who are the experts. So you can be asking more com composting questions. And I did see somebody on uh, the very beginning uh, offer up that they are very new to composting and they're learning so much already. So I'm sure, you know, there's gonna be lots of questions. Um, also for a reminder for International Compost Awareness Week, we have two more chances to celebrate uh, International Compost Awareness Week with um, on Thursday, we'll be looking at our circular system at SAVOR, where S-A-V-O-R, where they grow food in their rooftop garden, cook food to be eaten, divert food scraps for compost, and used and use finished compost on their rooftop garden to repeat the cycle. So they are totally doing grow, eat, compost, repeat. So that's for Thursday. And then Friday, of course, as I just promoted, uh, is the live Q&A session with experts on a local, regional, and national level. So thank you to our speakers and attendees and the partners um, that support uh, Illinois Food Scrap Coalition. Um, but before I, I think I just kind of jumped ahead a little bit. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to go to the questions from the chat. So Jen and Liz, get ready. Uh, this first question is from Cindy Chrisman. What is the science behind compost absorbs existing greenhouse gas emissions. That was from, that's a question about a slide, i.e. Um, can you cite sources of information that support this statement? That is an excellent question. Good. And yes, I can, but not right at this second. But there are, as Jen said, there's science to this and there are sources that support the sequestration and storage. It relates to the healthy soil issue and aerating soil. Um, uh, but I don't have that citation in front of me, but I am happy to uh, supply it, Cindy. All right, thank you. I, I would just jump thank in too and say um, the links that we're providing, if you go to the website for Project Drawdown, um, where they list the solution for composting, they give an explanation of how composting plays a role in drawing down carbon. Um, that's nice, and they link to a bunch of other resources. So I would second Liz's comment that we're happy to share some of those sources, but University of Illinois Extension is one that has that material. Project Drawdown has that material. There's, um, there's sources everywhere that really talk about what it is and the process of drawing carbon back down into the soil. And I believe Teresa went over some of that on Monday during our presentation. So we should pull some of that back up for you too, because she explained the, the process by which composting is helping to, to revitalize our soils. And another thought, Jen, while you were speaking, that reminded me of the Kiss the Ground movie of movement. It, it Kiss the Ground, if you haven't heard of it, is a wonderful movie that really focuses on soil health, soil health and the, the uh, positive benefits of regenerative agriculture. So it gets at a lot of it. There's a long, there's a full length movie, but I think there's a shorter one too. It might be for students. Um, and they certainly have a website. I, I'll put that in the chat in just a second, but that's a great resource also. All right. Uh, thank you, Cindy. That was a great question because that is really important about uh, closing the loop just because we, let's say we start, uh, we stop emitting carbon. We still have to take that carbon that is in surplus too much out of the atmosphere and composting is a huge, great answer. So thank you for that question. Okay. And this is from T. Edsey. Um, I've always been curious about toxins from textiles, bleached paper products, newspaper ink, etc., contaminating industrial compost. How is it mitigated? And uh, Benjamin did throw in that uh, whatever uh, answers you give Jennifer and Liz, uh, he wanted me to remind 
uh, that uh, this question and the question from uh, Gail Taxi for the Friday expert panel, um, they could probably answer the question there as well. But I'm pitching it to both uh, Jen and Liz. Well, and I actually would ask if we have a compost processor on the line today who would like to address that question. I certainly can address it, but they've got the day in, day out experience with it. So I, if someone's willing to take that one, unmute yourself and join the conversation, that'd be great. Hello, this is Erlene from Collective Resource Compost. Um, I can address part of this. I, um, I heard about the newspaper ink being a concern and all of the ink that is used now is all plant-based, uh, soy-based. Um, it, you know, it used to be a time that the newspaper was a toxic, um, uh, you know, it had, it had lead-based ink on it, um, but those days ended a long, long time ago. So, um, but I'm not remembering the other part of the question. It was, it was about um, how the process removes contaminants. So I think a lot of it would have, that's why I was talking about a processor, you know, there are certain requirements that are needed um, for you to, to have a quality finished product. And it's, maintaining your compost pile with the right balance that Liz mentioned already, um, having your, your greens and your browns, but it's also making sure that your compost pile is heated to a high enough temperature for a long enough period of time. So if you remember in the picture, and I'm going to, don't get dizzy, I'm going to try and go back a couple slides for you. Um, one of the things in this slide you can see in the top right corner, um, that is a windrow turner, um, that piece of equipment. It goes over the long piles of yard waste and food scraps that are all mixed together. And it makes sure that enough oxygen is getting into the pile and that the piles are able to stay hot enough to be able to remove those contaminants. Um, and I would definitely, I would, we do have processors who are going to be on the call on Friday, and we will pass that question for a more scientific answer and make sure that we have Charlie teed up to answer that one on Friday, if you're able to join us then. All right, so thank you uh, very much. And let's move on. Teresa uh, is asking, um, I have been told compostable products such as plates uh, which are more robust than our, just our regular paper plates. Compostable straws, utensils, et cetera, can only be composted by industrial systems and not backyard. Is this accurate? Um, it really depends on the specific item. So those more, those more robust items that are certified compostable, um, they need sometimes to be at that higher temperature for that longer period of time. Um, so I've put a compostable, one of the thick compostable plates in my backyard, and it technically will break down, but it's going to take a lot longer to break down. And um, it takes a lot more work to do that. Um, a lot of the reason that, we've, that we have all of the compostable serviceware coming out is less for what we, what we can do at home and in our backyard compost and more for how there can be resources available for institutions and, um, and restaurants for to-go containers. And one of the biggest tricks with those is that it's really hard for a compost processor to know if the straw they receive is a compostable straw or not depending on what it looks like. Um, some of the things that are, that are actually compostable don't look compostable, they look like plastic. And nationally and statewide, we don't have a clear way that we're, that we're labeling those. So I took your question and I expanded upon it. So I apologize for that, but I think that this is one of the most confusing parts for people who want to compost is knowing, you know, when it comes to something that's labeled compostable, can it be composted at home? Can it be composted in my commercial composting program? Great. And I'll jump in real quick on the, the 
Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. It obviously has many other provisions that relate to plastics, single-use plastics, recycling standards. Uh, on the slide, it referenced composting infrastructure, which is the part of the bill that specifically raised us focused on the food scrap piece. But obviously, there's many other aspects of it. And single-use plastic is obviously the primary piece of it. Um, and I appreciate, Jen, you, you clarifying that 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 driver is more sort of the single-use plastics from restaurants and, and industry. But so the, the national bill does get at that. Um, and it's one of the one of an, one of the other reasons to support it because it starts it puts greater um, structure around single use plastics and potentially eliminates them um, uh, in our in our country uh, in within a few years. So it's a, it's a very positive bill and it needs co-sponsors. So continue to ask your representatives getting back to the take action piece. And actually real quick on the take action also, sorry, but the, the um, Senate resolution, state Senate resolution that, that Kate mentioned that the it's SR0220, um, that's the uh, declaration, the, the uh, resolution that would declare May uh, 2nd through 8th uh, as, as Compost Awareness Week in the state of Illinois. I wanna follow up on Kate's comment when she was introducing that slide, it can be overwhelming and can be scary and, 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 and intimidating and you don't know what to do. So the way that Senate resolution was introduced was I found out that California has a similar resolution that they've adopted the last couple of years in their state legislature. I found the link, I saw it looked pretty straightforward and I sent it to our state Senator, Laura Fine. And she said, hey, this looks interesting. And two months later, she introduced it. And I swear, I'm not saying that to blow my own horn or toot my own horn. I'm saying, because don't be intimidated. Ask your representatives what you want. Tell them what you want. I happened, Laura happened to come speak to, uh, Senator Fine came to speak to another group I was a part of this weekend. And she said, please send us all those emails. Don't be afraid. We need to hear from you. Even if we're doing the right thing and you're happy, we want that, tell us. And if we're not doing the right thing, then tell us that. And if you have an idea, then tell you that. I mean, she basically said, email me about everything. I was kind of shocked she was that open about it. But I'm saying that because that there, our representatives really want us to do that. So don't be shy about asking questions or asking for what you want at the state level. You'll be surprised at what can happen, honestly. Thanks. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you got me going because that, that is my big like just wall. Just, a, just ask. Just yeah, ask. Just, just and ask. honestly, if you're uncomfortable asking or sort of putting anybody on the spot, send an email. Or maybe leave a voicemail. Call after hours if you if you're a little uncomfortable with it. But reach out, reach out to them. They'll be glad you did. You'll be glad you did. And it gets easier when you do it once. Yeah, because that's the next big thing is uh, just taking action on that legislative level. Well, has to, yeah. Start and check out Cecilia in the chat says that she got her town to recognize um, composting too. So this is something you can do on a local level, um, not just we can all go ahead and thank Liz for for helping Illinois recognize it, but now we've really got, you know, we can take it each into our own communities too. Thank you, that's excellent. Also, um, I did wanna, uh, when I was talking about uh, the take action slide, um, Benjamin wants me to emphasize that Illinois Food Scrap Coalition is not taking a position on SB 1167. Um, so I guess there have been people asking about that. So he wanted me to state that that so there it is um all right um let's see oh experts please share some information about ride-along programs you want me to take this one liz yes <laughs> the experts um, <laughs> all right well we're both experts so we could either either one of us could address this one but <laughs> Um, a ride along program is really, um, it's, a, it's a unique experience to be able to have one with food scraps, but it's growing and growing. So in 1990, Illinois banned yard waste from going to landfills and a whole composting industry was developed to meet the need for what were we gonna do with our yard waste since it could no longer go in a landfill. So we've got compost processors all over the state of Illinois that are able to take and process yard waste. So we already have in many of our communities pickups of yard waste or a place where you can drop it off. We have trucks that are coming. In many communities, you have um, your landfill pickup, your recycling pickup, and your yard waste pickup, whether it's a separate container or in a craft bag. These ride-along programs are ones where the hauler that's picking up your yard waste 
is allowing you to mix food scraps into your bag or your container and the yard waste and the food scraps are being taken to the compost processor. The hauler can only do that if the processor they're using is taking food scraps, which is why this isn't available in every single community. I mentioned earlier that we have close to 50 permitted compost processors, but only about half a dozen right now are accepting food scraps. Um, and in part, this will change as we start to use more compost and there's a demand for finished compost that's high in nutrients. Um, but the ride along is a super easy way for a municipality to offer this service, the pickup of food scraps to their residents, usually at no additional charge because there's already a truck, there's already a pickup. It's just adding to your container. All right, thank you very much. And what do we have here? Um, okay, now we're going to be talking about peat, which this is good because um, I would like that cleared up myself. Um, I've read, this is from Sue. I've read that peat is a non-renewable resource that stores a lot of carbon. And I'll just let you know what Teresa Johnston already said. Uh, and she responds by saying peat moss is different than peat. Peat is a non-renewable resource that stores tons of carbon, but peat moss is a growing organism. So uh, did you want add, to add anything to that, Jenner Liz? I do not. No, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll thank our, Teresa, our audience thank member for answering. That's the benefit. We can come on as experts knowing that we've got another 60 people on the line helping us out. With those yeah, answers. we're all in it together. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, because I was wondering about that too. I always thought that that was the case and it's not. Okay, this one is from Michelle uh, and it's a browns and greens question. What can be used for browns for people that live in an apartment and have a balcony compost? Good for you, Michelle. Specifically, if you don't use disposable napkins or paper towels and all the greens are food scraps. Well, that's where I turn to the peat moss and that's exactly why, because it, it can be hard to, um, again, even I, I live in a single family home, I would have to be raking my yard all the time to come up with the amount of, of leaves and sticks and twigs that would double the amount of the food waste that where our family's putting out. So um, I do, I welcome if other people, Teresa or others, if you have other ideas for, or for what brown material can help on a, you know, on a smaller scale and in an apartment setting, please let us know. Um, Cause like I said, I've struggled with it. And it was a friend of mine in the industry who suggested peat moss as kind of an easy, um, an easy solution. But Jen Jarland, you're raising your hand. I am. Well, I just wanted to say, and it's not for apartments uh, necessarily, but if you have a yard and you have trees, I for years have collected dried leaves and you have to be, you know, really conscious of if, how recently it's rained or you, you want the leaves to be real dry on the ground. You scoop them up and put them in one of those, you know, paper yard waste bags and then I stick them in the corner of the garage. So in the fall I collect, store them until spring and then when everything is green and you, you know, even everything is green, you can just start using those dried leaves. and. I've had you just three three of those large yard waste bags will take me through the whole season until things start drying out again. So that's what I've done. Right, but in an apartment where you don't have that kind of storage, that's why I'm. Um, I mean, even the peat moss is imperfect because it's typically sold in larger bulk, um, you know, uh, sections. Um, so I'm not sure. I, do, if, uh, I think in. Uh, I think when I been doing composting in my in apartments I've used shredded paper it could be brown paper bags those things work but I actually found that apartment composting um, was actually very easy with vermicomposting <clears throat> and that made it much much easier I didn't have to think about that that mix in the same way and that was easy to be doing inside yeah and, and Gail just jumped in the in the chat, uh, cardboard boxes. Absolutely, cardboard boxes are great. Um, just make sure they're not, you know, not coated with anything that it's 100% paper, the corrugated cardboard. Even I do corrugated boxes. Again, I just, it, it, depending on the volume you need, you might have to spend more energy. So I, I do it on a smaller scale to make some in our home on-site composting and just rip up the pieces of the box. Um, I like the paper bag idea. 
um, also, but just, yeah, that's a great, it's a great idea to add in. Um, yeah, I agree. I, the white shredded paper, cause it's been bleached. So I'm, I'm careful about doing the, um, the, the, the high grade paper in my backyard. I don't do as much of that I use. So I do backyard composting and I also use the collective resource service. That's how I found out about it. I started using it and then I started working for them. So um, for Erlene, so I use both. I, I, I like the backyard. And by the way, I, I, I sometimes backyard composting gets sort of a bad rap. Like it's not enough or it's, you know, it's kind of, that's great that you're doing that, but it's like, it can be kind of, Food. like it's not there's still so much more that can be done but I think it's really important to start with on-site composting if you can because then you're 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 putting the food waste back into the ground with the fewest amount of resources required to process it back into a healthy amendment you're not there's no truck and emissions taking it somewhere else there aren't other resources being used to to ultimately transfer that food or convert that food waste into compost so I I totally advocate for doing whatever you can on site in your backyard and then if you have another option, a curbside ride along option or a container swap program, which by the way, are typically are offered those container swap programs in, and I live in Winnetka and we don't, we don't have a curbside uh, composting program. We do have the yard waste program, but it's harder for our community to actually add in the food scrap pickup, even though our recycling hauler does it for other communities. I won't get into the details, but it's harder than it sounds in Winnetka. But the, so the container swap program was the best solution for us. There were no barriers to entry, collective resource, and another provider are in the area. And so we, those are available to our community. So those might be available as a, again, as a supplement to whatever you can't do in your backyard or on site, wherever you are. You're right. definitely going to have to take all of the great ideas coming in in the chat and share that with everybody. <laughs> So yeah. don't worry, we'll save a copy of it. We'll clean it up and send it out with the presentation. There are some great ideas. Now I'm getting a signal. Do you want me to conclude? We have a few few more questions. We have three more or or do we want to answer those via email or do you, what do we want to do? Should I give As it a, a go? Speaker, I'm fine either way. All right, I hope everybody's okay. It's 12.59. So uh, we're getting to that end of lunch hour. So for those of you that can stick with us, um, the Mary Beth is asking a great question. How can we pressure large landowners like corporations to pur purchase Illinois compost? I think that, um, I think pressure is a harder word. I think one of the things that we need to do a much better job about is promoting the benefits of a quality finished compost. Um, and, and really, I think that most people in Illinois and most corporations don't yet recognize how um, the impact that using compost can have on their grounds. And I think we'll learn a lot more about that tomorrow. I think um, the presentation tomorrow is going to show you sort of that whole cycle of um, of using compost and being able to use it to grow food, but also the end market, the compost end market committee of the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition is developing so many great materials that let you know what kind of compost you might, you would use based on whether you're using it for landscaping for, for an institution or a company. Um, to get to the pressure word that you asked in your question, I do think that a lot of it is consumer demand. Um, you see more and more big companies um, putting sustainability plans into place and they're doing it because their customers want that. They're doing it because it gives them a leg up in the market and they're doing it because sustainability a decade ago was not something that was cost beneficial to companies, but that has changed. When you look at what you have to pay for maintaining a landscape where compost is used to keep it healthy versus having to bring landscapers in and spraying and weeding and all of those other things. Um, people are finding that this is something that in the long run is affordable and worth doing for them. So again, a long answer, but I think number one, we all as consumers need to be demanding this of, of our companies where we work, where we buy items and, and start calling for a change. Excellent, yeah, it's a great renewable resource over in mulch. I mean, it's, that's awesome. All right, Liz, did you want anything to add? No, I'm good, that was okay. perfect. Okay, um, next question uh, from Pamela. How might a Chicago intentional community 
get help to do an audit to see how they should best compost. So I work for an organization called Seven Generations Ahead, and we actually receive grant funding to support communities in just that, in identifying what might be the best way to go about starting composting. So I think your first step would be to send me an email at jennifer at sevengenerationsahead.org, and I am happy to set up a call to talk through what some of those steps would be to share all of these great tools that we've shared today and more. Um, but I'd be happy to help you with that. Excellent, thank you. And last question, thank you for sticking with us, everyone. Um, is there, this is from uh, Hopalong, uh, is there any benefit to compost food scraps anaerobically capturing the methane, then mixing it with yard waste, paper, et cetera, then composting it aerobically. Yes, <laughs> I'm guessing you want more than that. Wow, um, yeah, no, that is, yeah. capture so, that carbon. So I think there's definitely, it'd be, it'd be interesting to, um, I don't know whether you were able to join us on Monday, but um, learning about the process that happens at the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. And, um, and that's, the, the process they have is really about bringing, you know, multiple different parts of this together into one. So they have biosolids that get made, but those get incorporated into a compost pile to be turned into finished compost. Um, there's, there's always a use for, for these technologies. It just depends on that cost benefit. If you've got a really strong methane capture program and you are you know you're capturing all the methane and using that for power, then then that is an option to consider. But we end up having like that's a whole different science. It's a whole different mix of how you're doing things. So um, I think the question is probably the answer is longer than I could give right now. But I think we've got partners in the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition. I think that Lakeshore Recycling Services can tell you about their, um, their they had a digester and they were digesting and then, and then turning, then composting what was left. But there were a lot of challenges to that, to the actual equipment and the science of it and making, you know, it was, it ended up being um, a really complicated process. So not knowing where you work, where you're asking, from what perspective you're asking the question, it's hard to answer. But I do think that, that we've got all these different sciences that are helping advance diverting food scraps from the landfill and finding ways to create energy or return nutrients to the soil. And I think all of these can be a part of, of the solution to the, to the climate challenge that we have right now. Um, and I'd love to. Oh, so that. let me jump in here. Can I, Jen, Jennifer, yeah. can I jump in? Yep. This is Paul Walker. Anaerobic digestion is different from aerobic digestion. So if you wanted to do anaerobic composting, you can, but the scale of which to have any volume and capture enough methane would be very extensive. When you do anaerobic digesters, you're usually using a semi-solid, semi-liquid process to generate much more methane. But trying to do composting anaerobically is a long process, and the compost produced from anaerobic compost is not very high quality compared to the compost produced aerobically. Thank you. Thank you so much for answering that Thank one. You. Very good. And Dr. Walker will be on with us on Friday if you have more questions for him. Join us then. Excellent. So again, Jen and Liz, thank you so much. And thank you everybody coming from all walks of composting life to join us today. Um, and so uh, I also wanna thank all the partners that supported what happened today and support Illinois Food Scrap Coalition. You can see there's so many wonderful partners here. And we hope to all see you here tomorrow. And thank you everybody.